Good to see you all. Yes, what an awesome God we serve. So, an announcement, we have um, the Gideons coming up Friday week, Share Jesus Without Fear, so they'll have it, it's Friday night, 7.30, having a bit of a um, talk about how to share Christ, ways to do that using the scripture, and all are welcome to that, so please come out, enjoy that time. Um, and we'll be in Luke chapter 6, if you want to turn there, as we continue our study through the book of Luke. And let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your goodness to us all, that you are almighty, holy, righteous, and good. And we worship you, Lord. We desire to draw near to you humbly, reverently, knowing that you are our Father, you are the King of kings and Lord of lords, that you, you truly rule forever and ever. And we, we just want to glorify you, Lord. We want to draw near hungry and thirsty to hear your voice and to be guided by your spirit. We pray you would minister to our hearts as we draw near and that we would walk in your ways, Lord, in the way that pleases you. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke 6 is where we'll be. Have you ever heard the term, laugh now, cry later? Is that, oh, you've heard that. Um, it suggests that there's a way that we can live today that is seeking fun and pleasure at the moment, but knowing down the road there will be pain, there will be sorrow, because we weren't walking wisely. And uh, this, that saying is very common in the graffiti around San Diego, where I'm from, where people would have it on their tattoos um, or on the walls, and it would be the two masks, the, the sad mask and the laughing mask, and it was the concept that, yeah, having all this money and having stuff, it's fun, but the end of it is bitter. It's going to end up in arrests and uh, gun battles and uh, raids and death, really. That there's a euphoria in having stuff and, and living in the high life, but life ends. And uh, we'll see that Jesus reverses this. Um, and I was thinking of the song that we sing sometimes by Brenton Brown, that's titled, Our God is Mercy. And there's a, there's a verse in it that says, you're blessed if you've been torn apart. You're blessed if you've a broken heart. Now that person that's torn apart, who has the broken heart, do you think they feel blessed? Isn't that an odd thing to say? Um, how can such debilitating pain be a blessing? Well, the blessing isn't in the pain itself, but in Christ Jesus, we have someone who heals the broken heart. He's the one who restores, who binds up our wounds. So there's hope in him. There's help in him. There's, there's salvation at the door when we see our need for a savior. And Jesus doesn't just stand at the door of the church or the door of our hearts when we're doing everything right, like we've earned a visit from him. But when things are going wrong, when we are lukewarm, like the church of Laodicea, Jesus is standing at the door knocking. He's wanting to be let in. And so we don't deserve to have the presence of God among us or within us, but he comes. Are we hungry and thirsty to seek him? I'm so blessed that Jesus comes to us when we don't deserve him, that he came to those people in Galilee and Capernaum and Jerusalem who were all into keeping the outward externals of the law, but their hearts were far from him. And sometimes we can be far from the Lord too. So may we draw near to him as we see people did in Luke. So Luke 6, starting in verse 1. Now it happened on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the grain fields and his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. And some of the Pharisees said to them, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? But Jesus answering them said, Have you not even read this, what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread, and also gave, to some, gave some to those with him, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. And he said to them, The Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Among commentators, there's discussion about why Luke says the second Sabbath. Um, that's the Sabbath following the earlier mention in Luke 4.31. 
So that was a very busy week. Or uh, the second Sabbath during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But regardless of why he says the second Sabbath, we know it was on the Sabbath day when Jesus and his disciples are walking through fields of grain and they're taking some as they're walking and they're rubbing the husks off and eating them. Um, and they were under the critical gaze of the Pharisees, who we'll see were always looking to find fault with Jesus and his followers. And they asked him, why are you doing that? It's not lawful to do. Now, what they were doing was lawful, according to the law. Uh, it says this in Deuteronomy 23, 25, when you come into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the heads with your hands, but you shall not use a sickle on your neighbor's standing grain. But they said, what you're doing Though it's allowed in the law, it's unlawful today because it's the Sabbath day. You're not allowed to do that. And according to the traditional interpretation, they were reaping, winnowing, and selecting. Yes, that is forbidden according to the law. Now, for generations, religious leaders of the Jews, they went beyond the explicit meaning of, of the explicit text and said, well, what does that mean to work? What constitutes work? What constitutes reaping? What constitutes sowing? And uh, I found this very fascinating on the My Jewish Learning website. It says this concerning the Sabbath today. It says, the rabbis decree that one should not only avoid forbidden acts, but also must not do anything that one resembles a prohibitive act or could be confused with it. Two, a habit linked with a prohibited act. Or three, usually leads to performing a prohibited act. So it becomes extremely complex, like real quick, how you can avoid breaking the law on the Sabbath. Um, for example, on the Sabbath, it's, it's prohibited to climb a tree because in the process of climbing a tree, it's quite possible that you will dislodge a leaf or break a twig, and that would be considered reaping. Um, so you can't do that just because you might break a leaf. Now, you can walk across the lawn and have the grass crunch under your feet, as long as it's not your intention to crush the grass under your feet. But it would be illegal for you to wash your hands over the grass because then you would be watering the grass and that would be work. So, really complex. Um, and then there's the Shabbos Goy, who is a Gentile that you pay to do things that you're not allowed to do that could, you could benefit from. You know, if I, if I need the light, I forgot to turn on the stove, or I forgot to set the timer, I could have this guy come over and he would do it. I'd say, oh, I'd really like to cook a meal today, but alas, I forgot to turn on the oven to uh, 220. Wink. Turns on the oven to 220. We're good. I haven't broken the law. Um, it's like, even the Orthodox Jews in that day, they realized there were exceptions to the law. If life was at stake, um, if they're, and today they say if life or health is at risk, the law can be broken. Uh, if there's a command to be fulfilled, like, like circumcision, if it falls on a, on a Sabbath, you would still do that, even because that would be breaking the law to not circumcise. So you have to do it on that day. Uh, or a risk of financial loss. So you could use these exceptions to break the law so you're not really breaking the law. Um, and Jesus steps in when they say, hey, this is not lawful for you to do. Why are you doing this? And he says, have you not even read this, that when David, what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread, and also gave some to those who were with him, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. Now to ask a Pharisee if they haven't read something, that's a pretty strong statement because this was their life to know the scripture, to follow the scripture, to understand and to teach the scripture. So he, he insinuates then that familiarity with the passage doesn't mean that you've understood it or you've applied it properly to your life. It was as if they had never read it. And he says, haven't you read this? What David did, how he went into the, uh, the tabernacle and was given bread, the show bread that's supposed to be on the table. Because he was in a time of desperate need, as an anointed of the Lord, he was not held as, a, he wasn't viewed upon as a sinner because he received bread that the high priest gave it to him with a blessing. So they said, and is there not someone greater than David 
or the high priest there in that grain field? Jesus. Jesus proved the Pharisees with the healing of the paralytic that he, he as the Son of Man had the power to forgive sins. He also was the Lord of the Sabbath day. I think Morgan explains well God's purpose of the Sabbath um, under law. It says, any application of Sabbath law which operates to the detriment of man is out of harmony with God's purpose. So the needs of people for survival, that trumps ritual. Moving on to verse 6. Now it happened on another Sabbath also that he entered the synagogue and taught. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. So the scribes and Pharisees watched him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath, that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man who had the withered hand, Arise and stand here. And he arose and stood. Then Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy? And when he had looked around at them all, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. But they were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Luke links these Sabbath days together. On another Sabbath, he enters the synagogue, he's teaching. There was a man with a withered hand, and the scribes and Pharisees were like, okay, we're going to see if he does anything, because that would give us an, an opportunity to accuse him of being a Sabbath breaker. Um, remember when Jesus healed the paralyzed man, and he had said, son, your sins are forgiven you, and he said, who but God could forgive sins? What blasphemy? And Jesus answered them um, by asking them, so he knew their thoughts, and he just answered them. And so what's easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to a paralyzed man, rise up and walk? Which would require actual power demonstrated in front of them all. And it's a similar situation here. Jesus knows that they're looking, and that they've singled out this man with a withered hand, and that they, they were hoping Jesus would do something so they might accuse him. And he singles out that man out of the synagogue and tells him to come right up front. And he asks his critics, with a question, he asks them a question. He says, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy? And their focus was on um, avoiding what was unlawful rather than seeing opportunities to do good. Keeping the Sabbath was a, a legal obligation for them. But Jesus was showing that it is lawful to do good to help others on the Sabbath, to serve the Lord in that way. Of course, the Sabbath never prohibited uh, showing compassion, mercy, or kindness to others. Now, there's two other parallel texts, one in Matthew and one in Mark. In the Matthew text, in Matthew 12, Jesus gives an example. He says, if one of your sheep fell into a pit on the Sabbath, surely you would reach in and lift it out of the pit. Now, they could justify that because they were saving a life or they were risking financial loss if they left the sheep in the pit. So he said, you would have pulled the sheep out. Maybe even one of them did it that day. Who knows? But he, he points out in Matthew 12, 12, of how much more value then is a man than a sheep. Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So the lives of people are more important than animals. You would save your own animal. Why would you look critically upon me healing this person? Why don't you turn, please, to Mark chapter 3, verse 5. Another account of the scene, and it's interesting to me that this is one of the very rare occasions that it's explicitly stated that Jesus was angry, and we see why. Mark 3, verse 5. And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. This shows us that anger in itself is not a sin. Often we sin when we're angry because we're offended. Our pride has taken a hit. Our expectations have not been met. We feel we've been unfairly treated. That was not what motivated Jesus' anger here. It says he was grieved. 
It was like mourning the hardness of their heart and their unbelief towards him and towards this man who had a real need that he could meet. And when we have those negative feelings and a sinful anger and we stuff it down, it distills into bitterness in us. Um, so the basis of Jesus' anger is not pride or selfishness, but love, love for God, love for this man, and love for the Pharisees. Because if they only would come to him and have life, they could be, be born again and made new, and the critical heart would be gone. They could have a new heart. He grieved over the hardness of hearts of people who knew the law and justified it to criticize others. To think that a miracle would not be welcome in your synagogue or that Jesus would, because it was Jesus doing it, you'd have a problem with it. That, that's pretty incredible that you could, you could be that way. And, and that's, again, when we look at these folks and we see hardness of heart, we see unbelief, we're looking in a mirror. We're looking at ourselves. This is us. This is how we behave. This is how we can think because we're no different than them. They needed salvation, and we do too. We can, use the, we can use the scripture to justify judgmental criticism of others, of even God and his grace toward them. I think of the Corinthian church. I mean, if, we, if there was a church that you knew that was divided, they were contentious, they were abusing the gifts of the Spirit. They were using grace as a cloak for sin. They were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper, and they were denying the resurrection. On and on and on. These are, these are issues that he, he touched on. Well, he calls them brethren. And so we ought not to put up walls and become polarized when Jesus is like, extend grace. Walk in truth. Speak the truth. Hold fast to it. But don't be judgmental. And Jesus said to the man, stretch out your hand. Now, that's something he couldn't do. He had a withered hand. It was like, you know, a hand that was dried up. And he says, stretch it out. In obedience to Christ, though, he could, and his hand was restored. So Jesus technically had not done any work. He hadn't even touched him. He just said, stretch out your hand. And the guy's like, hey, I can do it. And his hand was great. It was perfect. It was made whole. The, the Pharisees had done more work than that when they put on their robes and tied their tefillin on their arms and their foreheads. And Jesus hadn't, what did I do? But they knew he healed them. They're going, oh, we knew it. Uh, what are we going to do about this guy? He's a troublemaker. We need to shut him down. We need to kill him. It said they sought how they could destroy him. Like, how can we destroy this guy because of what he's doing? Blinded by self-righteousness, blinded by unbelief, they saw themselves as defenders of the faith. There was this troublemaker named Jesus that they needed to teach a lesson and silence him. And again, there is a bit of that legalistic Pharisee in each one of us and definitely in me. Um, so what, what did Jesus teach them? He says he used the scripture, he used the example of David, and he used um, the, the miracle to prove he is the Lord of the Sabbath, and it's good to do good on every day. There's, it's good to show compassion every day. That we should never use a law as a reason to judge or to not do good that's in your power to do by God's grace. The law was intended, Romans 3 says, to stop every mouth and to make the world guilty before God. But there's a way that we can use the scripture to, to attack and to condemn to justify ourselves. So may the Lord reveal to us when I have the hard heart, when we have the hard heart, because that grieves him. Luke 6, verse 12. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. And from them he chose 12, whom he also named apostles, Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called the Zealot, Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. Jesus went to a mountain to pray. He spent all night praying to God. 
And the Jews, they had set times of prayer throughout the day. They had a morning, afternoon, and evening prayer time that lasted about half an hour each. And uh, I was reading that their approach to prayer is like climbing rungs of a ladder. There's like four rungs where you, you extol the name of God, you recount the things that he's done, you acknowledge his, his power, his oneness, you praise him, you bless him. There's scripture readings. Um, you contemplate his deeds. Um, and then at the very end, you start asking God for your needs. And as I was reading through some of these prayers, I was like, wow, there's so much we could glean from this. Because I think every Christian, in reading those prayers, um, would find it so inspirational how God is reverenced and how he is honored. And uh, they, there's a lot that we can learn from them. I think our impromptu prayers tend to focus more upon our needs than who God is and what he has done or using the scripture to pray to him um, or rehearsing the deeds that he's done. And it's really cool when you read some of those prayers, the daily prayers, the allusions to the triune nature of God and Jesus. Like there's references in there that you're just like, wow. Um, praise the Lord when people see that. Um, and Jesus did more than climb a few rungs of a ladder. I mean, he went up a mountain. He spent all night in the presence of God uh, before, pray, before calling his apostles. Uh, disciple, so he, among his disciples, he had many of them. He chose 12 whom he called apostles. Uh, Morris says this, A disciple was a learner, a student, but in the first century, a student did not simply study a subject. He followed a teacher. There is an element of personal attachment in disciple that is lacking in student. The word apostle, it means one who is sent. We see Jesus is referred to as an apostle in Hebrews 3.1. There's others called apostles, but for our purpose, and uh, Jesus uh, called these 12 apostles uh, as a matter of distinction, and we see that also in the book of Acts, that when the apostles are referenced, it's, it's referring to this group, because that's what Jesus called them. Now, the call of an apostle, it shouldn't be claimed with authority to write scripture, um, but it's a, it's a role that we see in the church, just like prophets, teachers, um, those who are gifted, um, and we should, res we should resist efforts people might make to self-appoint themselves an apostle as if they have the same credibility as those in the scripture because those sort they tend to draw people after themselves rather than pointing to Jesus. Um, but we see um, Paul and others called apostles. So those who are sent. He, uh, he called Peter, called Simon, he called him Peter, and Andrew, James and John, they were brothers and fishermen by trade. Andrew and John were formerly followers of John the Baptist. Philip and Bartholomew, Bartholomew's called Nathaniel. Um, so we have this interesting thing where you have the Greek name, and then you have the, the English name, and then what Jesus may have called them. And so it gets a little confusing depending on who was the audience. So like Matthew was written more to Jews and Luke was written to uh, Theophilus as, we'll, as we've talked about. So Matthew, that's Levi, the tax collector from the previous chapter. Thomas, the one who, among many, who was doubting Jesus' resurrection. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot. And Zealots are really an interesting group because they were uh, an extreme, aggressive, first-century Jewish political movement that strongly opposed Roman occupation. And they, they hated even the Jews who would make deals with them. And uh, they encouraged noncompliance. Some resorted to assassinations and terrorism. So they were a very, they were zealous for the Jewish nation and resented and, and fought against either subversively uh, or, or um, obviously against the Romans. Um, and finally, Jesus chose Judas, the son of James, also called Thaddeus, and Judas Iscariot, who would betray him. It's fitting they're listed two by two because that's how Jesus sent them out. He sent them out two by two to prepare the way for him before he went into a village. And it's a very diverse group, right? You have fishermen, a tax collector, a zealot, You've got totally different groups of people that only Jesus could possibly bring together. Um, 
And out of all his disciples, Jesus chose one by grace who would be his betrayer. He knew that, but he still called him, and he came. And praise the Lord that he has called us to follow him too. I mean, it just becomes more diverse with culture, and, and uh, praise the Lord that he is the same. No matter how things change, we can count on him to love us and to joyfully receive us as we follow him. Luke 6, verse 17. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him for power went out from him and healed them all. After Jesus chose the 12 apostles, he came to a level place, it says, with his disciples. Now, because of the address that would follow and its similarity to the Sermon on the Mount, some people say it's an abbreviated version of the Sermon on the Mount. Some people call it the Sermon on the Plain, and they say, well, Jesus spoke in a lot of different areas and would have said similar things to the different crowds that he met with. So, whether it's an abbreviated version or not, it really doesn't matter. We know Jesus said it, and it's true. Um, And as he preached the kingdom of God, it's good to know that, yeah, in Matthew, there are more things included that would be for Jews who would have known the law and been familiar with things. And you see the fulfillment. There's There's a heavy emphasis on the fulfillment of Scripture. But because this was written to likely a Roman official, Theophilus, which means lover of God, there were things that were more suited for that audience. So you would, and you even see that in, in the Kings and the Chronicles. And what, what's sometimes included in the book of 1 and 2 Kings, it's omitted in 1 and 2 Chronicles because Chronicles is more focused on the Judah side of things. And uh, I think it's interesting the, thing, the little tidbits that are left out of one, but spoken of in the other. So that's why it's important to have the whole counsel of God as we study through to uh, know we walk in truth. That um, title, Most Excellent Theophilus, we see Claudius Lysias addressing Felix in the same way. So that's why it's, it's likely that Theophilus was a Roman official. So there's a great multitude of people. It says, all Judea and Jerusalem gathered to Jesus, as well as from the coast of Tyre and Sidon. These were Phoenician Gentiles who had heard of Christ, and they came to him. Jesus had been sent by God to the Jews. He went into the Jewish territory, but he welcomed the Gentiles who came to hear him. He taught them. He healed them. He delivered them of their uh, demonic oppression and, and their diseases. It says, everyone tried to touch him, because power went out from him and healed them all. This word touch, it's, it means to attach oneself. So it's not just like touch. It's like touch. It's like they were, they were all pressing in to hear him, pressing in to just have him because there was power going out from him. It's kind of like if you can imagine or you've seen those, the pictures of, of uh, aid, some uh, food and water going into a village that's been decimated by drought and famine, and people are desperate. You know, their, their kids are dying, they're starving, and they're all crying out. They're clamoring around the vehicle trying to get something because they have a need and they know that this is a chance to have that need met. And there's a sense of desperation we see in these people all crowding around Jesus, these sick people, these people that are oppressed by unclean spirits. They're like, This is our chance for healing. This is our chance for wholeness. And they all pressed in to grab hold of him. Thinking, do we have such an urgency to come to Christ? Do I have such an urgency in my prayer to draw near to God? Because I know I I cannot help myself. And I'm ruined without him. I'm hopeless without him. And that my sense of need is so urgent and so real. And we don't have to travel great distances to meet with him, to receive from him. It's basically the distance between your knees to the ground and humbling ourselves before God. And we don't even have to hit our knees, but I encourage you, humble yourself before God because he is God and we need him. 
We need, just as much as we need salvation, we need strength for the day. We need wisdom and discernment and hope and help. That's all from him. As we acknowledge him as Lord, as we confess the need that we have, and, and we have needs that we don't even realize that we have. Making our requests known to God because he's invited us to, knowing that he alone is able to help us. He will answer. Luke 6, verse 20. Then he lifted up his eyes toward his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. It says he lifted up his eyes, not to the multitudes, but to the disciples. So he's looking toward his disciples, he's teaching them, and he said things that would have been shocking. This would have been shocking to hear. And maybe we've heard them so many times, it sounds like poetic, like uh, the Lord's Prayer or something. We haven't really taken time to study it or to think about it. We can repeat it, but it's like it, it's gone into our heads and it's come off our tongues, but it hasn't really sunk into our hearts what he's saying. He says, blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Do you suppose the poor felt blessed? When they, they have nothing? They're desperate? To be blessed is well off, prosperous, and happy. You feel well off when you're poor. Well, we know it's not... The only reason why I don't think this is a sick joke is because it's Jesus saying it. I'm like, Jesus is saying this, so it's got to be true. But how does this work? How does this fit with my idea of what blessing is, because my thought of blessing is like abundance, right? My cup overflowing, but not like, blessed are you poor, because yours is the kingdom of God. Now, why would he say this? The poor realize they have a need, that they have a need for God. The, the wealthy, they have that covered. If they get into trouble, if there's a bill that they need to pay, they're like, oh, just pay it. No prayer involved in that. But if you don't have the money, you seek the Lord and say, Lord, I am in desperate straits here. I don't have the money and the creditors are coming. I don't want to lose the house. I don't want to lose the car. I don't want to lose the job. Help me, please. There's a desperation that the rich man doesn't even have. So the poverty in the people, it awakened in them a desire for a savior, for help, a willingness to beg. And that's like the poor that's used here is like the beggars. Blessed are the beggars, the poor, those who have great need, because theirs is the kingdom of God. They place their faith in Jesus to provide. The rich man, he builds for himself an empire on earth where they're comfortable, but the poor outcasts, though they're willing to humble themselves to enter the kingdom of God, which it, it surpasses any glory of a kingdom on earth, and it's eternal. So it lasts forever. It's, the, it's where we ought to lay up treasures. And then he says, Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. It strikes me how needy we are for so many things. We need food. We need water. We need sleep, some more than others. Uh, we need um, sunlight. need um, just oxygen. There's a heap of needs that we need on the outside, but then we also need, I need my heart to keep on beating, and I need my brain to keep on firing off neurons, and my nerves to be working, and all the things inside of us. And then emotionally, right, we have these emotional needs to be accepted, and acknowledged, and um, to have something useful to do, and to have a sense of purpose in, in the things we put our hands to, to, uh, to be satisfied but the hunger, right? The hunger is emptiness. There is a need there. There is a need that is seeking satisfaction. And a hungry person, if you're still hungry and you're at the buffet line, you're like, I'm going to get some more because I'm still hungry. So they're going to avail themselves of that food. They're going to have that sustenance because they need it. Blessed are those who hunger now because today is the day that Jesus can fill you. 
Today is the day that you can be satisfied through him. That you can have the acceptance and forgiveness and the living bread that comes down from heaven that gives eternal life and we trust in him. And the Holy Spirit who fills us and refreshes us like living water. If you're full of yourself, if you're satisfied with what you have, well then why would you be motivated to get up to eat? If you're full, you might as well just loosen the belt and go to sleep. Right? You're full. Don't even talk to me about food. I've had enough. But when you're hungry, you start looking. Right? You get up. You go to the pantry. You go to the fridge. You try to find something that you can eat. Where are those leftovers? Oh, the kids got to them already. I see. I see how that is. Yeah, contrary to the laugh now, cry later, Jesus says, Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. You can laugh all the way to the bank with ill-gotten gains. It's fun for a season, but br sin brings death. The one who has enduring joy is the one who has sorrow for their sin now, who recognizes their lack, who recognizes their hunger, and who's motivated then to come to Christ, to seek to follow him. And these disciples, that attachment to Christ, it's like these are people that left their families. They left their jobs for seasons, for, for, for a period of time, where they left employment just to be with Jesus, just to hear Jesus speak. There was this, this need they had that was met only in him. The one who's broken over their sin, the one who weeps, it's not because of our tears, but it's by the grace of God who is, is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we repent through the blood of Jesus, we will receive the forgiveness. And oh, how pleasant that is, how glorious it is to know that you are clean, that you are free, that you are uh, no longer separated from God because of your sin, but you have a new life. You, your sins have been expunged forever. Man, that's something to rejoice over. Psalm 30, verse 4 and 5, it says, Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. When you cry yourself to sleep because of your grief and sorrow, there is joy for you in the morning through Jesus Christ, through faith in him, because he's given us a hope and forgiveness and acceptance and love that that will, nothing in this world can possibly separate it from us. We have the promise in God that he keeps all our tears in a bottle. They are known by him. And he will also, when we meet him face to face, he will dry our tears. Right? There's a time when sorrow and the grief of life will be done and will be in his presence forever. There is much that causes us sorrow and grief today, but in his presence, the Bible says, is fullness of joy. Psalm 1611, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. If you see someone crying, the more compassionate among us will be drawn to that person. How much more compassionate is God than that person? God is the most compassionate. He knows what you're dealing with. He knows what you're going through. And he comes alongside and he extends his love to you. Praise God for his compassion and his grace. Jesus said, blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Is there anyone here who likes being hated, excluded, reviled, or having a bad reputation because you follow Jesus? I could just stop there before, if you follow Jesus. Like, nobody likes that part of it. No one likes to be hated or excluded or reviled. Um, but Jesus says, blessed are you when for his sake, that's the consequence. These disciples that he spoke to, they had chosen to follow him, and it came at a cost. This is what they faced. They were excluded by their families. They were hated. They were reviled. They were spoken of as evil when they were actually following the Son of God. 
they probably didn't feel blessed at the time. But their faith in Jesus put them in good company. He says, well, that's exactly how the, the prophets of old that God sent, the good prophets were sent, and that's how they were treated. They were mistreated. Faith in Christ urged them to rejoice because they were graced with Jesus' presence now, so the presence of God now. They also had a reward in heaven for their suffering, a, a reward that could not be stolen or lost or corrupted. I'm sure that these disciples, they shed many tears over the things they faced for making that decision to follow Christ. When they went back to the synagogue and people gave them the cold shoulder, when their businesses just dried up because people blackballed them and just said, no, you're following that Jesus character and he's no good. He's a troublemaker. And they're like, but he's the bread of life. He's the good shepherd. He's the door. He assured them of great blessing and reward that every need would be met. Their hunger and their longing would be satisfied. Their tears would ultimately res re result in the fullness of joy. And that rejection for his sake qualified them for additional heavenly reward. And it's only faith in Christ that can help us lay hold of that and say, right on. We can be like the disciples uh, in Acts, that they were rejoicing for being counted worthy to suffer shame for the sake of Christ when they were beaten up for proclaiming him. Verse 24, Jesus moves into some woes. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. In stark contrast to the blessing, those who are blessed now, because that's, that's a key point. He says, you're blessed now. You're blessed today. Jesus pronounced woe on the rich, those who were full, those who were filled with laughter, those all spoke well of. The rich, they saw no need to come to Christ for their salvation. Um, they had, and they had received all the comfort in their possessions and money that they would ever have. That's very sobering, that someday all those things would be taken away from them in death and reveal the spiritual bankruptcy that was the reality the whole time. Though they kept the law, though they did all these things and offered these sacrifices, those who were full and had no hunger to fear God or to, to be forgiven, they would one day experience profound emptiness and grief. They would be the ones crying, and there would be no one to dry those tears. Those who made a joke or a mockery of God would would regret it when they realized that Jesus was the way. He's the only way, and I missed it. I missed the chance for eternal life that I had through Christ. Have we come to Christ today, poor and in need, hungry, mourning over the state of our souls, our life apart from him? Have we come desperately to him? Because attending church is not the same thing as coming to Jesus and trusting in him, right? Coming into a building, singing a song, it doesn't mean that we've really with intentionally drawn close to Christ, desiring his touch. Jesus didn't promise that we would feel blessed in the midst of struggle, right? He never promised that you're going to feel like you're, I just want to feel like everything's fine. <laughs> he doesn't promise you that feeling, though there are times where we do feel. I mean, even without Christ, we could feel, hey, it's the last day of school. I'm on top of the world. Like, what could go wrong? <laughs> well, a lot of things can go wrong. But, you know, with Jesus, we have him, and he has us. And nothing can separate us from his love. And by faith in him, we can know we are blessed now. We are blessed right now because he is our Savior who loves us, who's done everything for us. And because God is gracious and good, we can sing that song that says, you're blessed if you've been torn apart. You're blessed if you've a broken heart because there's healing and wholeness in Christ. Could you please turn in your Bibles to Hosea 6, starting in verse 1.
Hosea chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Now, as we went through the book of Hosea, I guess kind of recently, within the last couple of years, we know that there was a lot of pain and sorrow um, experienced by the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom of Judah because of their idolatry, because of their departure from God. And God allowed them to fall into the hands of their enemies, and they experienced plagues and, I mean, the pestilence and the famine and uh, the loss of family, and then the loss of their, their uh, inheritance and being taken captive in Babylon, seeing Jerusalem brought down to ruin. It was just devastating for the nation and for these people. But look at what Hosea, one of those good prophets, what he says in chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. He says, Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. Isn't that awesome? He says, let's return to the Lord. Let's do this together. Let's go to him. Because nothing that's happened to you has been by chance. It has, it, he said, God has torn us, but he's the one who will heal us. He has stricken us, but he will bind us up. He, is the one, he has allowed us to feel the pinch of hunger. He's allowed us to have poverty. He's allowed us to be excluded and reviled and hated because it would turn us to him. He's the one that we need. And God will allow those things to open our eyes to see that need and to respond so we can be made whole. More whole than when everything seemed to be fine. That sense of lack, your longing for satisfaction, comfort, and purpose in our pain, it is discovered in knowing God. Because we can wonder, like, what is this? Why am I suffering like this? Why are things so difficult? And I, I don't have the answer to that question. But I know that God's purposes are fulfilled even in the midst of suffering because we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, that he will redeem even the schemes of Satan to accomplish his awesome plans. And we need look no further than Jesus, whom Satan entered uh, Judas to betray him so that he would be killed. And God turned that right around and made salvation available to every person by the grace of God so we could be redeemed and our sins could be atoned for, that justice could be served, and that we could be the beneficiaries of his grace and love forever. So let's come to Jesus empty. Let's come to him hungry. Let's come to him broken because we are blessed now through him. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you are so good to us, so gracious and kind, that you have shown compassion on us, uh, where it says that God demonstrates his own love for us, that we, while sinners, Christ died for us, that he died while we were your enemies, while we wanted nothing to do with you, you have um, made us aware of our need. Thank you, Lord, for making us needy and for supplying the needs by your grace. Lord, I pray that those who are mourning, those who are sorrowing, those who lack, Lord, that we would come to you. Um, and thank you for the provisions you've given us, Lord, for the, the richness of your grace and even the possessions you provide. But may our hearts never be attached to them. May our affections not be on things of this world, but upon you. May our attachment, Lord, be on Jesus Christ as we draw near to you to lay hold of you for that purpose for which you've laid hold of us that we would follow you, and that we would honor and glorify you. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here today, and I thank you for the gospel, its power to save. I thank you for uh, Jesus, that he is the, the Lord of the Sabbath day, and that he has shown us such kindness through uh, his word and through his suffering, through his resurrection. And Lord, may his life be on display through ours for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.